My name is Ellen Holsty, and I am the Community Program Manager at Pierce Cedar Creek Institute, and I want to welcome everyone to our second virtual herpetology conference. Uh, we're hopefully going to learn a little bit about how to manage for reptile and amphibian survival today. So our first speaker this morning is Jordan Gray of the Turtle Survival Alliance, um, and he's going to talk about our urban monsters, as you really see on that screen. That's a great picture, Jordan. I love it. Um, the alligator snapping turtles in the Bayou City. So, well, welcome very much, Jordan. And I'm so excited to see your talk this morning. All right. Thank you very much, Ellen. Um, well, I'm excited to present because this is just an incredible species. They're an iconic species of the waterways of the Southeast and the Mississippi River drainage. Uh, however, they are increasingly becoming imperiled and I'm not sure if uh, many of you know, they're recently proposed uh, to be listed under the Endangered Species Act. And that listing is set to be um, uh, a, uh, I just lost my words. Uh, they're, they're set to make an announcement on that listing this year. All right, so first off, who is the TSA? You, you may or may not have heard of us. Uh, if you go to an airport, you've probably definitely heard of the TSA, but we are not them. We are the Turtle Survival Alliance. We formed in 2001 in response to the Asian turtle crisis. We are committed to zero turtle extinctions. Uh, and we're made up of a diverse assemblage of organizations, institutions, and individuals with a passion for saving turtles. Together with our partners, the TSA is the largest and most comprehensive turtle conservation organization in the world. Strategic partnerships are our core strength, plus a bunch of really extraordinary people. And as a side note, talking about uh, partnerships, the AZA SAFE, American Turtle Programs, which is now one of TSA's newest programs, Ellen was talking about John Ball Zoo, they are one of our partners under that program. So that is our core strength, is bringing people and bringing pr programs together to work for conservation. But of course, like you can see from that picture, none of this would happen without individual turtle conservationists who dedicate their lives to saving turtles. And we use a three-pronged uh, conservation action approach. Restore populations in the wild, secure species in captivity through assurance colonies, and build the capacity to restore, secure, and conserve species within their range country or their country of origin. So let's talk about the alligator snapping turtle. And for many in Michigan, I am very, very sad to tell you that there are not alligator snapping turtles in Michigan. For many of you who perform outreach in that state or maybe in the Great Lakes region, you'll probably find that people call most common snapping turtles alligator snapping turtles. But sorry, there are no alligator snapping turtles in Michigan. So alligator snapping turtles are the largest freshwater turtle in the Western Hemisphere. Um, they can get up to 31.5 inches in carapace or top shell length. They can weigh over 200 pounds. We recently uh, caught one, well, rather uh, our colleagues caught one in Texas weighing 211 pounds. That is a very, very large male. And they have a bite pressure reported of up to 1,000 pounds per square inch. So yes, watch your fingers. You can identify the alligator snapping turtle by three distinct ridges on its carapace, the top shell. Also, if you just so happen to get close enough to its mouth and look inside, there is a little lure-like appendage called a vermiform appendage that is within its mouth and that is used for hunting. Um, and they also have fleshy projections on the head and neck, 
of which are more pronounced than that of the common snapping turtle. Also, feeding. They are heavily scavengers. Um, and this is something that a lot of people don't think about. These turtles are very important to the waterways in which they live because they are virtually the vultures of the water. They scavenge heavily upon carrion, so dead animal matter in those waterways. They also use that vermiform appendage, that little lure that you can see in the picture there um, in hunting. And they use what's called aggressive or Peckhamian mimicry, whereby they just sit there and they mimic the surrounding, the logs, the rocks, um, other submerged debris, and they wiggle that lure uh, through um, controlling blood flow in that vermiform appendage. And fish, an unlucky fish, uh, will think that it is a worm and come to an unfortunate end within that snapping turtle's mouth. Their diet is actually pretty varied. Uh, fish, carrion, reptiles, and amphibians. Yes, they will actually eat other turtles. Um, birds, mammals, invertebrates, and plant material all make up the diet of this uh, incredible, large, and iconic species. So they do have a pretty large distribution. They range from the Florida Panhandle west to eastern Texas and north to western Illinois, where they are quite uncommon now, and actually where there are programs to restore populations along the Mississippi River in Illinois. Either way, the alligator snapping turtle only inhabits waterways that drain to the Gulf of Mexico. So any snapping turtle found that drain in waterways that drain to the Atlantic Ocean are common snapping turtles, or in rare occasions, a translocated alligator snapping turtle. Maybe it was once a pet and the person then realized this turtle gets very, very large and probably shouldn't live in my bathtub. It, uh, its habitat, it inhabits rivers, creeks, bayous, oxbows, rivers, swamps, sloughs, reservoirs, ponds, and canals. It prefers areas with submerged structure, such as root masses, log jams, and undercut banks. And it is rarely observed in the same habitat as the common snapping turtle. So in all of our research uh, in the waterways of Texas, we have yet to find the two species cohabit uh, cohabiting. All right, so monsters in the city. So alligator snapping turtles, although they range into East Texas, were purported to be functionally extirpated from Harris County. And by the way, Harris County is the county in which the uh, fourth largest city, Houston, Texas, is located. Now, when I say functionally extirpated, I mean that, yes, there may be a few individuals left out on the landscape, but as far as being ecologically relevant, they uh, were believed to be no longer that. They are regarded as imperiled and a state threatened species in Texas. As I said, they're proposed for the Endangered Species Act. So the question is, could bayous of the greater Houston metropolitan area harbor functioning populations, which was not to be believed before? Well, the evidence that we found said yes. Uh, through social media, through news clippings, through uh, blog posts, through um, institutions that are now our partners, it showed large alligator snapping turtles. And so we very much believed that, well, not only are there alligator snapping turtles, but with these large adults inhabiting the bayous of Houston, Texas, again, the fourth largest metropolitan area in the country, that these turtles are likely not only inhabiting the area, 
but they're probably breeding and are a ecologically functioning population and ecologically viable. So we started a project. First, let me tell you a little bit about Buffalo Bayou and you can see the photo there. So there's Houston, yes, it's a huge city. And if you look at that blue line that goes through it, that is Buffalo Bayou. It transects the city. It's a 53 mile waterway that formed 18,000 years ago. Um, of course, the alligator snapping turtles enjoyed this bayou for thousands of years before humans decided to make uh, its banks and its surrounding area into a uh, basically a steel and concrete landscape. Um, but it is one that we were very, very interested. Uh, could it have snapping turtles? So let's talk about the bayou a little bit more. It is heavily urbanized, as one can expect of a waterway going through a city. Most of Buffalo Bayou is buffered by private residences, commercial property, golf courses, and parkland. It, of course, is highly altered habitat. There are some areas uh, that are fairly natural, but for the most part, there is runoff, pollution, erosion, channelization, and riparian degradation. The picture in your lower left-hand corner is the most natural looking part of the bayou. That is what a bayou uh, should look like, but the other pictures show what most of the bayou does look like. So would alligator snapping turtles, the uh, Western Hemisphere's largest freshwater turtle, be living in here and living well? Well, that's what we wanted to find out. So uh, myself and Eric Muncher, uh, both of us in these pictures here, started trapping a spot in Buffalo Bayou as part of a herpetofauna uh, assessment of Memorial Park. Well, we put in these hoop traps, came back and checked them the next morning, and we had captured six alligator snapping turtles overnight. So as you can see by the look on Eric's face there, this was very, very exciting. So not only had we seen them in pictures, but now as turtle biologists, we had them in hand. And so this was the catalyst for a long-term study on these turtles in Buffalo and other bayous in the city of Houston. So the project continues, trapping. I just had to show this because trapping is actually a lot of fun. Well, for the researchers, maybe not the turtles. We deploy 10 foot uh, long, four foot wide, uh, double-throated hoop traps. Uh, we go into the bayous and we set them. As you can see from the pictures, we make sure that enough of the trap is above water should we catch a turtle because they are air breathing animals. So it can come up for air. And most times we do catch turtles. And I'm gonna get to that uh, in just a few minutes. But this is a really, really fun uh, research project. So, Project continues, data and tagging. Of course, when we do this research, there is a purpose behind it. It's not just, quote unquote, boys and girls with toys. Uh, we are research scientists and we are trying to gain data that can help uh, make conservation decisions and help uh, landowners and stakeholders along the bayou be able to make uh, decisions with conservation in mind. So we gain a lot of different uh, data from these animals, different morphometrics, uh, such as their carapace and plastron length, their weight. And by the way, these animals are very heavy. As you can see from the lower left-hand corner, this is how one must measure away an alligator snapping turtle. We have rebar and you can see that rebar is being bent. Um, and a lot of the turtles that we have captured thus far weigh anywhere from uh, 40 pounds to 132 pounds. 
many of them weighing over a hundred pounds. So yes, these are large animals and really, really impressive. So yeah, we've caught turtles, turtles of all sizes. And what does that tell us? It tells us, yes, there is an ecologically functioning population of alligator snapping turtles in Buffalo Bayou. So from that little hatchling you see up on the left, all the way to, if you look at that turtle on the cooler, uh, he has been nicknamed El Gigante. Uh, that photo actually went pretty viral um, because he is just an absolutely enormous male turtle, but we've caught in everything in between. So that shows that the turtles are thriving there uh, in this very, very uh, uh, human impacted environment where there's pollution and degradation and runoff and channelization, the turtles are actually still doing well and there's enough food sources for them to continue to grow, breed and for the population to multiply. So several years ago, there was this hurricane that decided to make its way towards Houston. And I was living there at the time, I'm now in Georgia, but I uh, had the great fortune, we'll call it, of uh, living through Hurricane Harvey. It struck Texas as a category four storm. So this was an enormous hurricane. It dropped record-breaking rainfall across the Houston area. So in our study site of these animals, it dropped between 40 to 60 inches of rain uh, just in a few days. That is an incredible influx of water to one area. So I'm about to show you what our research area looked like during that time. And there it is. Um, so that is Buff Buffalo Bayou runs somewhere beneath those overpasses. Uh, yes, that is one of the largest highways right there in Houston. And this is what the landscape looked like. So the question for all of us was, what are these turtles doing during these great flood episodes like Hurricane Harvey? Are they staying in one spot? Are they moving downstream? Are they actually moving about into the forest to maybe look for other food sources? Well, this brings me to a very special turtle that is now named Harvey, Harvey the turtle. So if you look at that picture in the upper left-hand corner, you will see Harvey sitting there on the highway. Well, what we believe, because alligator snapping turtles do not tend to travel over land like their common snapping turtle counterparts, is that Harvey, yes, was probably perusing some of the areas that are normally dry when the floodwaters were at their height. And as floodwaters do, they receded quite rapidly. So at four o'clock in the morning, somebody reported to the police that there was a large turtle walking on the highway. And so uh, Eric and I got a call at about 7 a.m. saying, we've got this big snapping turtle. Can you come check it out? And so we went over there, we scanned it, uh, and it had a pit tag in it. And that turtle that you see in the lower right-hand corner was when we first captured Harvey. He was captured in February of the year before. So that means that not only did we know where he came from, but we could tell how far he had moved. And interestingly enough, he had only moved about 50 meters from where we had initially captured him. So with all that water coming through during Hurricane Harvey, Harvey, the turtle really only moved a very, very short distance, demonstrating that these turtles are uh, well adapted to these riverine environments that can greatly uh, change in the volume of water and the height of water being moved through. Good news for Harvey is that we are able to relocate him to exactly where we had captured him earlier in the year or the year previous. 
We also added a telemetry project because so from that we wanted to know where are these turtles going, how are they utilizing the habitat, and this is for those doing the telemetry, a pretty intensive project. So what we did is in 2018, we affixed radio transmitters to 10 adult alligator snapping turtles because we wanted to see what each individual's movement was, what their habitat preferences were, uh, their utilization, and be able to build home range polygons for these animals. And these animals are actually still being tracked to this day. Um, I do wanna say, in case you wanna read more about this effort, we have published um, several papers on this that you might be able to look up. But also we do have uh, our annual magazine, Turtle Survival Archives, of which I've given Ellen the opportunity to put that link into the chat. And for $10, shameless promotion, uh, you can purchase that magazine and read about that effort. One really cool thing we found is that for the most part, these turtles do have relatively small home ranges. They are homebodies. They like to stay in the same area. However, we did have one male that traveled 14 miles from one site to another. So. It's a lot of tracking, uh, but it's a very enjoyable experience, but it's an experience that gives us really, really valuable data uh, as to how that turtles utilize this habitat. And that data is valuable because in a habitat like this, where there are construction activities uh, that may impact how the turtles utilize the habitat or to the turtles themselves, we can give that information to Texas Parks and Wildlife, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, and uh, those other stakeholders so that hopefully uh, the turtles habitat is impacted less based on what we've learned about the turtles. So like I said, there are a lot of threats to this population. And one of those major threats is bank stabilization. You see a, a river, a bayou, a stream, a creek, they are natural, naturally sinuous. Uh, they are dynamic and over time they shift back and forth uh, based on the forces of nature. But humans have a tendency to want to control that flow, especially when it's in a large city and that flow might make a skyscraper topple over or an apartment complex fall into the river. So bank stabilization is one of the things that is ongoing in the Buffalo Bayou. But one of the things of note, and you'll see, if you take a look at the upper middle picture, notice that bank stabilization activity using uh, steel walls. Well, notice that same bank in the upper right-hand corner uh, just months later. See how the water is already cutting around that? Water will find a way. Just like in Jurassic Park, life will find a way. Water will find a way. It is always moving. It is dynamic. And it is going to find the easiest way because, that well, there's this thing called gravity. Um, and so bank stabilization efforts are something that are of great controversy and can impact the habitat of the alligator snapping turtle. Another thing that really, really impacts these turtles and impacts them throughout their range is the active and refuse fishing tackle that is a pervasive threat to them in the bayou and throughout their range. Buffalo Bayou is heavily fished. And in Texas, one of the biggest sport fish is the alligator gar, aptly named for its long snout and very sharp teeth. And we find these alligator gar in Buffalo Bayou routinely, but we also find the fishing tackle that is either cut or accidentally left behind or maybe comes loose or is purposefully left. Um, and sadly, we also find dead alligator snapping turtles because of that. 
there's nothing that is, you know, gets your heart uh, uh, twisted more as a turtle biologist than kayaking down one of your research sites and seeing that site on the right hand side, a turtle floating because alligator turtle, alligator snapping turtles do not naturally float. And we know in that case, the turtle has been entangled in fishing gear and has died because it has drowned. Again, these are air breathing animals. But some of the things to really think about is that this is an unknown uh, number of losses to populations across their range. And the other thing is, is even though they are protected throughout their range, um, they're not really protected from these type of incidental takes. How do you, how do you protect an animal from a, a legal activity like fishing? Um, and so really it's unauthorized take of a protected species by legal means. Um, so this is something that has really led to population declines throughout their range. So this past year, we had something amazing happen. We cataloged just in Buffalo Bayou and not even in the, that whole 53 miles. We really only work in about a 14 mile stretch, but we cataloged our 100th unique alligator snapping turtle. So not only are they uh, not functionally extirpated, but we believe that this population in the heart, in the city central of the fourth largest metropolitan area in the country is quite possibly the densest and most robust population of alligator snapping turtles throughout their entire range. Uh, that is incredible. As of today, February 25th, 22, uh, 2022, we have now cataloged 117 unique animals. And by the way, because of property access and ease of getting to the bayou and other dynamics, such as dealing with hydrologic issues, such as major rainfall events, there's many areas of the bayou that we have not even been able to trap. So these are very, very uh, localized trapping areas that we're able to do. And we've captured 117 animals just throughout six trapping sites. So just imagine how many animals are in this bayou. And that just, that is exciting for us. And this has generated a lot of press. There's been press throughout uh, newspapers, uh, throughout the United States and Texas. We've been able to generate uh, several scientific papers out of this. And there was a proposal to channelize pretty much all of Buffalo Bayou in the name of flood control, but our research and the public comments that came out of it has now made the United States Army Corps of Engineers rethink their whole entire project. And the new plans would actually uh, completely um, uh, uh, subvert uh, any uh, any threat to the alligator snapping turtles and the habitat. So it just goes to show that science is really, really important and can make a change. Uh, so I have to say turtle work, uh, teamwork makes the turtle dream work. Efforts like this don't just happen by one person. It takes a lot of people putting in a lot of hard work and a lot of man hours to get this kind of data and be able to generate uh, this kind of interest, uh, not only in Houston and in Texas, but throughout the United States about these animals. And it's also a teaching experience. We've been able to get a lot of youth involved in this experience because let's face it, if you are able to interact with an alligator snapping turtle as a child, I'll bet that makes an impression on you uh, throughout the rest of your life. So where do we go from here? And maybe that's where we'll get some questions if we have time. But I just wanna say a big thank you 
And of course, if you want to learn more and get involved, you know that we are on social media. So is everybody. Find us at, it's pretty easy. It's at Turtle Survival pretty much on everything. And that's where you can get our most up-to-date information because we do work across the world. So every day we have postings that talks about the conservation work we're doing. So just want to say thank you all very, very much. I'm not sure if there's time for questions. Uh, Ellen, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you so much, Jordan. I, I definitely learned a lot. We do have some questions. Um, we'll take about five minutes for questions and then we'll let, give people a Zoom break. <laughs> um, yeah, sure. So one statement or one comment that I wanted to bring up towards the beginning of your talk, uh, David mm -hmm. Myth said who does our Michigan Herp Atlas. So when people want to record where herps are, he helps. Uh, oh, you let David Myth said then. I did. He said that there are actually two records that exist in extreme Southwest Michigan uh, of alligator snapping turtles, uh, though likely introduced. So Michigan may have a couple, but probably not probably more introduced. So just David, to, David and I can chat about that on the yeah. side. <laughs> there you go. Um, so uh, anyway, one of the questions that we had coming up was uh, one of the conservation groups that this person has worked with did not want to publicize that creature's ability to adapt to human infringement because they believed it would green light more development and habitat destruction. What are your thoughts on that? Okay, repeat the first part of the question. Yeah, so they've worked with some conservation groups that didn't want to publicize the, uh, a creature's ability to adapt to human infringement because they believed it would green light more development and habitat destruction. Uh, do you have any thoughts on that of publicizing that, for example, that these alligator snapping turtles are doing decently, at least in this place? Yeah, that's actually a really great question. And for, uh, let me just say, uh, for most at-risk species, especially ones that may be threatened by poaching, for instance, and I know there's some in Michigan, like spotted turtles, uh, typically you wouldn't want to publicize that information anyway, because they're a very easy uh, accessed animal. Um, but in, in occasions like this, while it shows that these turtles have adapted to a man-made environment um, because of the turtles um, uh, requisites of having um, uh, submerged structure, which is still in the, are in these habitats, um, having various micro habitats like deep pools and river bends, which still occur in Buffalo Bayou, um, making sure that knowledge is known is still uh, very important because as I demonstrated, um, being able to show that yes, they're living here, but here's their habitat requirements. And if you change these, if you change this ha uh, habitat um, to the level that your project is proposing, then no, these turtles will, will not live here. Um, our, our data and our research um, demonstrated that if, for instance, that proposed project went through, that the turtles would be effectively extirpated from that area. So they've adapted to what has been done but they would not be able to survive the impacts of what was proposed. Um, That's a so, great point, yeah. Yeah, so I think it's very much on a species-to-species -species basis. Um, you know, using spotted turtles as an example, you know, no, you wouldn't want a, a community to immediately infringe upon their habitat. That would be extremely deleterious to the population. Um, so I, I very much think there, there is, you know, species to species basis. Um, and that's why it's so important uh, to gain valuable scientific data on all of these species um, so that we can make those informed decisions. That's a great point. Um, there were a couple of questions about drivers, and you talked about a little bit about that in terms of the depth and um, 
and how the the bayou moves but just drivers promoting the density of this population it seems like such a nice robust population um somebody was asking do you think it's subsidized by some sort of human input such as bait fish other food resources that's helping this population okay so that's an excellent question and one that we uh, brought up with U.S. Fish and Wildlife in our um, statement regarding the proposed Endangered Species Act listing is that this uh, species of turtle uh, was heavily hunted for uh, the turtle soup industry um, throughout its range for many, many decades. And many of those populations uh, were hunted to the point of either functional uh, extinction, um, uh, extirpation, or they uh, are in just very low numbers now. However, in this area, a large metropolis was built around the habitat. And so the habitat would not really be conducive for hunting these animals and poaching activities. So we actually hypothesize that by having this large metropolis where people are actually very, very concerned about the bayou, I mean, our researchers get the police and, and game wardens called on them routinely. And so, and we appreciate that. Um, and so we hypothesize that because of that, this particular population uh, was not subjected to the poaching and other, uh, um, we'll call it collection instead of harvesting threats that maybe other more rural populations would have been um, subject to. That was a great response. Um, thank you so much, Jordan. Uh, great information. I learned so much about alligator snapping turtles. Um, and we hope to see all the great work that the Turtle Survival is doing in the future. Uh, it's a great organization, so thank you. Mm -hmm.